Good afternoon, I'm Vashon Brown with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. The International Labour Organization, ILO, estimates that at least 14 million jobs have been lost in Latin America and the Caribbean as a direct result of the COVID-19 crisis in the region. In a new report released on Tuesday, the ILO noted that the pandemic especially affects sectors that generate a large number of jobs, such as commerce and the service industry. Describing the impact of COVID-19 as catastrophic, the report revealed that the pandemic is causing a loss of 5.7% in working hours in the second quarter of this year, equivalent to 14 million full-time employees. The ILO described the pandemic as the worst crisis since World War II, causing a rise in unemployment and job insecurity. Despite struggles getting markets for their produce, the Agriculture Ministry is insisting farmers should continue planting that word from Minister Odor Portfolio and the Agriculture Minister J.C. Hutchinson during a tour of the first batch of excess tomatoes to be processed into juice at Tradewinds Citrus Limited in Bogwalk St. Catherine. Here's Krista Campbell. Juice for the school feeding program is the first step in the government's efforts to help farmers find a market for their excess produce. Duane Neal, better known as Worky in Prospect Manchester, showed us his callaloo ready to be reaped but going to waste because he hasn't found any buyers due to the disruptions from COVID-19. We have a, a guy from Junction, he mainly supply Negril Hotel them with the food stuff, him I buy 5,000 cabbage, 600 callalo, tomato, see him I buy the thousand. Me can make at least 20,000 out of my garden for a week out of callalo, just one side alone and look on the next side, so you know so me I make money. But unlike other farmers facing a similar struggle, he's not given up. You know, uh, the ground end up mash up, so we just cut it off and that's where I end up have to throw your hillside because we want the ground to come back up that we can have more. Minister Without Portfolio with Responsibility for Agriculture, J.C. Hutchinson, wants all farmers to continue planting. We are encouraging all those farmers who have reaped their produce to get back into production right away because three, four months down the line, when the hotels and schools open, we have to provide them with food. As such, if we don't get the farmers going into production, we are going, into be, going to be in a serious problem. Meanwhile, even though the coronavirus has significantly slowed business and many jobs are being lost, Mr. Neal has been rotating the few workers he has. I employ four workers, so right now I only have one. Because money not we really apply the amount of work we would want. So we have to have work right through the week and we alone can do it. Yeah. So we kind of depend on go slow. Okay. But we still have to help with one work this idea, the next one work the other day. The government has budgeted $240 million to help lessen the impact of COVID-19 on farmers. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has responded to calls for an island-wide lockdown. Strict measures have been imposed, such as nightly curfews, in an effort to stem the spread of COVID-19. However, countries like Italy have imposed a total lockdown in the fight against the virus. But Mr. Holness believes the nightly curfews could aid in sustaining the economy while limiting the spread of COVID-19. What we don't want to do is for businesses to reach a point where they have to scale down, they have, they have to lock down, and then it takes them a long time to restart. So even though they, they are losing some customers, they are losing some of their business, we're going to keep the measures to a point where they can continue to function, maybe even break even, maybe they, can, they make a loss, but they can sustain it for a period of time. While speaking at a media briefing yesterday, Mr. Holness explained that the aim is for businesses to recover quickly once the crisis is over. What we have been trying to do is a balance between very strong economic policy and very strong public health policy. And I think we have found that equilibrium position that will place us in that very green right-hand corner box 
that says strong economic rebound to pre-crisis levels. That is what we want to be. We want to come out of the crisis and rebound very quickly. And the Prime Minister has announced stricter measures for the Easter holiday period. So as of today, Holy Thursday, the curfew will run from 8 p.m. to 7 a.m. Friday morning. But on Friday until Easter Monday, the curfew will begin at 3 in the afternoon each day until 7 o'clock the following morning. So as for markets, they will remain open until 7 p.m. today. The markets will be closed on Good Friday. Easter Sunday and Easter Monday. And this will include the market district. It will include transportation hubs where there is vending taking place and the arcades. All beaches will be closed over the Easter weekend. Let me repeat that. All beaches will be closed over the Easter weekend. That means all beaches will be closed from Good Friday through to Easter Monday. There have also been changes to the stay-at-home order from April 8 to April 21. So if you're 70 years and older, then you are only allowed it to go out once per day for food, medicine, and what the Prime Minister calls the necessities of life. symptoms or respiratory symptoms, they must stay at home. We're also advising the following categories of persons to stay home. Again, persons with comorbidities and persons with respiratory illnesses. So even if you are not 70 years of age, even if you don't have symptoms of flu or respiratory illnesses, if you have these comorbidities, the diabetes, the, the um, hypertension, we recommend that as much as possible you stay at home. If you don't have to be on the, the road, stay at home. If you have respiratory illnesses but you're not showing symptoms, you may have terrible sinusitis, you may have asthma. If you don't have to be on the road, if you don't have to go to the market, stay at home. And it appears the government may have to develop a state quarantine facility to house Jamaicans who want to return to the island. Since Jamaica closed its borders to incoming passengers, scores of Jamaicans have been begging the government to accommodate their return. Some have even been isolated on ships. The Prime Minister made this comment at a press conference on Wednesday. There are also persons that were sent overseas under government-sponsored programs whose employers have indicated a desire to repatriate them. We recognize that we cannot keep our borders closed indefinitely. However, we cannot put our population at risk of the spread as a result of additional imported cases. The health ministry is to receive test results today on individuals who came in contact with the fourth person to die in Jamaica from complications related to the coronavirus. The patient, a 48-year-old man, died yesterday at the University Hospital of the West Indies. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bisesa mckenzie gave an update on the case. So, so far we have tested a few, some of the close contacts of that person and we have found that there are four persons that are positive. So we continue to do the investigations and more contacts of that person will, will be tested um, between tomorrow because it's, sampling has been done today. So they will be tested tomorrow and we'll be able to give more information about contacts for that person. The other three persons who have died from the coronavirus in Jamaica are a 41-year-old man from Westmoreland with a travel history, an elderly man from Clarendon who returned from New York, and a recovering coronavirus patient who suffered a cardiac arrest at the University Hospital of the West Indies. There are currently 63 confirmed coronavirus cases in Jamaica. And we now take a break on the Midday News. We'll be right back. Please stay with us. 
Welcome back. Continuing the news now. The country's public transport sector is reeling under the curfew orders and the requirement to carry fewer passengers. President of the Jamaica Association of Transport Owners and Operators, Jatu, gave a glimpse of the sector to TVJ News this morning. More in this report. In terms of taxis, they are required to carry one less passenger than they are licensed to do. That is the restriction as of now. So if they were licensed to carry five, they will carry four. And if they're licensed to carry seven, they will carry six. That announcement from Prime Minister Andrew Holness on March 16 in a bid to contain the spread of the coronavirus. But since then, the revenue streams for taxi operators, especially in the Kingston metropolitan area, have seen a drastic dip. That's the word from head of JATU, Louis Barton. Our estimate from operations in the Kingston area for, for, uh, for taxis is that the business is down by at least 60%. Some guys tell me that 60%, some say it is even worse than that, right? But so business is really down. Mr. Barton says the dip is due to a number of factors, including high gas prices. Data from Pretterjam showed gasoline prices are down only 6% since the start of the year, while global oil prices are down more than 60% at under $27 a barrel. But despite this, he says he's in support of the measures being instituted to quickly contain COVID-19 locally. In the meantime, Mr. Barn is suggesting that the government make some adjustments in persons that are required to wear masks. Mr. Barton says public taxi operators should be included. Here's why. The operation is that we carry at least 2 million passengers a day. Now, I think that should be taken into consideration when we're talking about the restrictions. Probably we should have where all operators must wear a mask. This coronavirus shows up the need for a, a new thinking I see we are J-U-T-C, which is what the government really look out, of, out for at any one time. They are given special encouragement to do this, do what, um, carry special passengers. But, but I'm saying that the taxi operators who are not owned by the government, all the transport operators that are not owned by the government, they should be looked at in a, in a special way because they are carrying many Jamaican... Machine Masters, TVJ News. Discrimination continues to hamper the COVID-19 response in at least one parish, Clarendon. The authorities, though, say despite that and other challenges, they're undeterred. Here's Prince Moore with the details. The breakdown of COVID-19 cases in Jamaica shows grim reading for parishes such as Clarendon. The central parish, particularly the southeastern belt, has emerged as a battleground for the fight against the pandemic. Unfortunately, yes, I'm Clarendon seem to be the epicenter just now, at least a, just a section of Clarendon. And one case is for concern. But we are not frightened, we are not panicking, we just want to prepare as best as possible. The last few weeks have been useful in doing just that, preparing. Officials say hospitals located within the Southeast Regional Health Authority, Sarah, are ready to respond to COVID-19 cases. We, so we have an isolation ward at the Maypen Hospital. As a matter of fact, all our hospitals with the Southern Regional Health Authority, we're mandated to have an isolation ward. So we are doing what we are doing some retrofitting. So all of them have an uh, isolation ward. We are doing some retrofitting in all the hospital wards. So what we have now is that we have completed Mandeville, Black River, and Maypen Star. So what we have holds held some of the persons here. And, and then we move them you now into Mandeville and then retrofit in some uh, Maypen so that we can have them. So, yes, all the hospitals will be, I wouldn't, well, they are accepting COVID um, patients right now. Residents were also reminded of their role in the fight, namely to self-quarantine if they've traveled recently or contact the authorities for further assistance. But... Member of Parliament for Clarendon South East, Colonel Charles Jr., feels the latter measure is being impeded by stigma. Discrimination is counterproductive because what it does is that it pushes persons who are sick or, or who are symptomatic to hide. 
it pushes persons who are within these areas and trying their best to protect themselves and protect the communities to be silent. We don't want that. Prince Moore, TVJ News. There are still concerns about the possibility of examinations for students who would sit the Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate CSEC and CAPE subjects. This, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to affect the Caribbean region. A few weeks ago, the registrar and CEO of CXC, Dr. Wayne Wesley, said the council was thinking of having the exams in July. But based on predictions and what's happening with the virus in the Caribbean, there's a likelihood that the revised dates may also be missed. It's why president of the Jamaica Teachers Association, JTA, Owen Speed, says other measures may have to be looked at. Seems to me as if we will have to consider in a very serious way using the SBA scores and actually the, the recommended scores from our teachers to come up with a grade and maybe just matching that with the history of what those recommended scores eventually turned out to be. And um, that is maybe a way to go to avoid getting into the next school year which should start in September. And it's time now for sports. Despite securing a 2-0 victory over Bermuda last month, the reggae boys remain 48th in the April edition of the FIFA World Rankings. The Jamaicans also stay at 4th in the CONCACAF region at, and at number 1 in the Caribbean. Mexico remains at number 1 in the CONCACAF as they are 11th globally while USA and Mexico round out the top 2. Jamaica will need to remain in the top 6 in the region for another 2 months in order to be automatically played in the hexagonal round of World Cup qualifiers. Meanwhile, the top 10 team ranks. Meanwhile, the top 10 ranked teams in the world reads Belgium, France, Brazil, England, Uruguay, Croatia, Portugal, Spain, Argentina, and Colombia. Jamaica's highest ever FIFA ranking was 27th, and that was achieved in August 1998. And that's the Midday News. I'm Vashon Brown. Join us at 7 for a primetime news package. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, have a good afternoon.